Okay, guys, as, as you know, <laughs> yet another week has come and gone, flowing in, unbelievably. Uh, of course, you did know from last week that I was interviewing Frank uh, the next day. Um, I, and to be honest, I'm so looking forward to this. He's had a big impact on my life for lots of reasons. And uh, I'm so looking forward to introducing to him. So without further ado, um, Frank Clifford, well, we're going to hear his whole story. I'm going to use sort of lots of stuff I know I want to talk to him about. He's absolutely amazing as an astrologer, guys. So, Frank, welcome to our little Wednesday night thing. Thanks for joining us. Hi there, Jack. Thanks for being, oh, thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here. It's, a, it's an absolute pleasure. Um, you know, I, I think the guys will remember, I did say this, you know, that we've done, a, we've done, this is the 20, this will be the 27th of these weekly things that, that have been published. Some have been kept private to ourselves. And you're the second astrologer. And the astrology guy, the last time, has still got the biggest viewing figures, which is just amazing. So everybody, I suppose, secretly is interested in astrology. You know, you, you just do. I got into it much more uh, because of primarily yourself. And just so people know, I've actually gone to summer schools in Oxford and sat in with Frank doing his thing with these global superstars in astrology. And Laura, who's an astrologer, regularly I get to listen to things and watch things um, that she participates in. So Frank, maybe you will be always seem to do with a guest. This, can you tell us your, a bit of your backstory? How did you fall into astrology, for example? Well, uh, thanks for asking. I, my mum used to take me to see psychics or different people and all tell me stories of amazing predictions that have happened. And it, yes, it's so. ironic because I really don't do predictions as an astrologer, no, even no. though astrology is you know, linked to the idea of foreseeing the future. But uh, I'd hear all of her stories. I think um, I grew up when um, Joseph in the Technicolor Dreamcoat was in the 70s and 80s, and the idea of prophecy, that fascination with knowing the future, that really, uh, that really got me interested as a child. And I'd hear all her stories, and we went to see an astrologer back in 1989 called Tad Mann, and he was an American astrologer living in London at the time. And I got home from the consultation and I sat down and I looked at the chart. It was, I'd been reading about astrology. I think most of people of my generation, I'm 47 uh, now, um, most people uh, read the Parker's book on astrology, either the Complete Astrologer or their um, later book, uh, Parker's Astrology, or they read uh, Linda Goodman's Sun Signs. Yeah. And so I was reading probably from the age of 10 or 12, all about the signs and fascinated with them. But it took him um, till I got to 16 in 1989 to see a professional astrologer. I came home, looked at the chart and it was gobbledygook, but I had a book from the astrologer from Tad and my chart. And I just worked out what all the symbols were. And like most people that learn a bit about astrology, you, it becomes an obsession. It becomes something that you want to know more about. And it's one of the subjects where everybody has an opinion of it, whether they know anything about it or not. Uh, and one of those subjects where you can just uh, do a shallow, um, a shallow, uh, you can do a little swim in the shallow end of astrology with sun signs, or you can dive in deep and really understand the different um, facets of what it is. And it's a, a subject, as you saw with Ray Merriman, a subject that can be applied to so many different parts of somebody's life. Uh, without it being a belief system, without it being the only way to do something. And that, you know, it speaks to some people, it doesn't speak to others, uh, but everybody has an opinion on it. Yeah, yeah no, it's one of those amazing subjects. I mean, the guys who are following this will remember that a few weeks back, well, maybe a couple of months back now, we had, Al, you know, we had Dr. Al Dan Dannenberg on. He, he, just so you know, he's a guy who um, was in a hospice expected to die and his wife sort of uh, went in and just said like this you're giving up here and sort of give <laughs> kind of beating up verbally and, and and he reversed himself right out of there and his story's phenomenal and we were interviewing him and stuff and he then gave away that he, he, he had quite a lot of belief in you know reincarnation and life between lives so we ended up having an interview with him just on that we had him back for that and it, and I've always been open to the notion of it. And so if people consider for a moment, even if reincarnation, you know, for a moment, just think, what if it's real? What if it's the way it is? 
And if you were coming here to experience a life for a purpose, you would really want to choose the exact location you were born to the parents you were born with. And of course, or parents, and to, um, to be in the right location at the right moment to maximize that life experience. And to me, that's what astrology does. It's so amazing. It finds the exact location, the exact moment, bang. And it's like your thumbprint, it's yours, it's personal. And from that moment on, what you guys call transits and stuff unfold and life just becomes amazing. Uh, and you can understand it through astrology. So, so, you, so how did you get actually into Obviously, the fascination of it, you know, getting a chart done and figuring it all out. What got you to think, well, I want to do this as a career? Because you're blooming good at it and you've been very successful. Well, I I didn't really have that, didn't come to that conclusion a long time. Uh, I I went and did a media degree up in York with, a, with the University of Leeds, actually, but it was in York. And great hands-on sort of media degree was what it was promised to be. And I came out of there feeling, I don't really want to do this. I don't like the selling your grandmother approach to how the media can be, the ruthlessness of it all. And I was learning astrology, learning palmistry at the time, at the age of 18, 19, 20, during the time at uh, university, and found that it just, uh, my interest in people uh, really helped learn it, and also my curiosity about what makes people tick. And being able to see it as a system that it through symbol revealed that. Yeah. So I think my understanding of astrology and what the birth chart says has changed over the years. When you first think of it, you think it's your map of the future. Then you realize it's really a map of potential. And with the right people around you being born into the right situation, you can develop certain aspects of that potential. But what if you're a revolutionary sp spirit, but born into a place or a time that doesn't allow that for your gender, for your color, for your generation, um, certain parts of the chart aren't going to be fulfilled. Yeah. So the way that I see it is that we've really signed up uh, to be born at a particular moment. And I don't know whether that's true or not, but it's the way that I see it. Uh, right. And if you see it like that, you don't think of the difficulties in your life as a curse, as your karma, you see them as things that you've actually been invited to resolve, to, to meet head on, to understand through other people. And it just gives you a different, uh, you, you stop blaming uh, the system or society or Trump or whoever you want to blame. And you stop blaming everybody else. And you start to realize all of it's an invitation. Yeah. And that to me is one of the great liberating gifts of using astrology or using any of the subjects, whatever speaks to you, use it to liberate yourself from the idea of it always being somebody else's fault or that you're not good enough. And I think they're the, I'm sure they're the, some of the philosophies that you base mind store on as well, yeah. of course. Yeah. The chart just gives you an instant insight into a lot of the things that somebody signed up to do, whether they choose to do them or not. It's yeah. uh, yeah. free will and all that. It's amazing you said that. I, I remember sitting in one of your courses or one of your, yeah, yeah, one of your summer schools at Oxford. You know, Laura was there and I, 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 I booked up for a couple of them. I don't remember which astrologer it was. I vaguely remember being American, a big man, fantastic speaker. And, and he made this point about that we all have these transit things, astrology, you know, I'm just using your language for a moment. And the... You get these, these transits and you can see them there coming in your chart. And what he said, which was amazing, was you can get a really tough transit in theory looking at it. You know, Plato and a Plato or God knows what you guys talk about. <laughs> but the thing is, um, what he said was you can choose how you respond to that. You can actually take that information and work it to your advantage. And that, it, that was the acceptance of it for me that was so exciting you're right it's an invitation to to grow and develop but understand some of the dynamic that otherwise you wouldn't be aware of that astrology lets you see it's like a window in what's going on you've got a choice what you do with it i love that about it and to me the key with all of that is that uh with that invitation 
a lot of people go through transits and think, oh, what is Pluto going to be doing to me this year? Or they read it in even in their uh, star sign columns in the newspaper. Saturn's going to give you a tough time next year. Um, that type of um, <laughs> uh, mental block is something I, I try and move away from. For me, the you can't, I always say this to my students at the LSA, you cannot stop other people making crazy decisions. You can't stop them dying, being sick, leaving you, choosing to live on the other side of the world, whatever goes on. But you can, you can choose your, your way of responding to life and to things. And that's what the transits do. So to me, if you're talking about Saturn being in Capricorn at the moment or moving into Aquarius, what's the invitation? What, what are you wanting to do with that? Again, you can't stop what Trump does. You can't stop this. You can, you can have your say in the world around you through voting, through participating in some way. But really, astrology is a deeply personal, self-focused uh, or self-centered yeah. discipline. It's all about what do you want to do? How do you want to, want to respond in this moment? Yeah. You know, one of, I, I think I said this to the guys last night. Um, I had a consultation with you years ago, I, I, not, not like 10 years ago, like, I don't know, it feels like three or four years ago. And you predicted, not, not, not predicted, but there's a likelihood that someone who, you, who used to work with you is going to come back into your life. And if they do, and you got together, it could be very successful. And that happened, uh, Frank, you know, it, 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 exactly in that transit period you had mentioned. And what's interesting about it is him and I have now created a program we call Seven Sense. And that's to do with the two of us bringing our awareness with a client and the client brings their experience and, their, and we put it together and create this magic. But funnily enough, um, about 10 years ago, I got together with people who were in, at that point working with me teaching Mind Store. And we got, in, we got, a, we got involved with the astrology um, uh, out, in, out in Ireland with Andrew Smith, who you'll know. And Andrew, and what we came up with is we came up with, we used this term as what the seven saints. And the seven saints for me was just what you're alluding to here is that the simplistic part of mind story is you, things are going to happen in your life, but you can choose your response to it. Well, I start, your exact same thing was coming from the same angle, but it just gives you that much more awareness of what is happening and what's potentially there. And what I, what I, we called it the seven saints. The seven saints was this ability to program how you respond, mm. but having astrology to understand your, 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 your journey. Uh, but, but also what I loved about it was if, if I teach people to program and begin to manifest things because they constantly use their mind a certain way and attract people, places, opportunities, what if we aligned that to what their chart said their potential really could be? Because one of the things that, that is amazing about astrology is it can fit, or I seem it as a lay person, it can be, can be amazing to figure out what you might be good at. And if you if you've got an idea from your birth chart what you might be good at, well, why don't you just program in that area? It seems so simple, but that's what I was about. Um, and, and, but that never it didn't come to anything. We're just we're using the, the, the seven cents in a different way slightly. But now, but um, so you so then you get into it. You be presumably you then. You study more, you get more and more aware of it. You then start, I'm using the word consult, you know, you start having some clients, one would imagine. How did that feel going into that? Was that risky? Were you confident? And then, of course, the big part of your journey is into the, as you mentioned, the London School of Astrology. And I think people are going to love to hear about that because I've sat in and stuff and the range of things you offer is amazing. Do you mind telling us a wee bit about that? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. I... One of the things I try and teach the students uh, to avoid a lot of the mistakes I made. So I was learning from the age of 16, didn't go to any school at that time. I enrolled on a um, distance learning course, a correspondence course as they were called back then, 30 odd years ago. And I really felt I wanted to learn what I wanted to learn. And I think a lot of astrologers are what we call Uranian people, people that are very individualistic, prefer to, think for themselves, be not necessarily in a group learning the only way to do something. Mm -hmm. And so um, I spent most of my 20s head down learning, um, moving into seeing clients from the age of 
21, uh, the palmistry helped because I learned palmistry or began to learn palmistry about the age of 17. Went to a very eccentric palmist who told me I'd be married at 21 and my partner would die. And I came away from that thinking, surely there's got to be a better way of doing this. Yes, yes, yes. Because if that, if then you know, whoever I'm going to meet and want to marry or get involved with will die. What a bizarre um, uh, way of prognosticating, you know, it really, and it, of course it didn't happen. Mm. And I, it did give me good grounds for, for not, I mean, you, you make mistakes in, in the first few years you're doing it and you still make mistakes sometimes or, or misjudge how to say things. It's all, with astrology, it's all about using the, the symbols and communicating these with good language and trying to articulate something well for people. But also it's a dialogue. So I learned through my 20s really to, uh, to sit there, listen to the client rather than try to be somebody who knows it all, has got all the answers. And uh, it's interesting that when I go to America to teach, uh, America, um, this is a sweeping generalization, so uh, forgive me for this, but tends to enjoy the guru set more than we do over here in yeah. England and Scotland and, and yeah. probably possibly other parts of Europe too. And never wanted that, never wanted, um, being an Aries myself, I wanted to uh, um, light people's fire, get them interested so they could do their own thing. Uh, the sessions often were single sessions, so it would be go off and try that and reach for it, give it a go, have courage. Yeah. Uh, don't come back and I'm not, don't come back in a counseling dependency way unless you really need to. I still have a few clients over the years who come every few months uh, and it's more of a counseling session, a bit of reflection on the chart, but that's pretty rare. I tend to be somebody that says, you know, give this a go. Um, you're very welcome to come back, but I don't really set up a guru or a dependency thing with anybody. Um, first of all, I wouldn't, wouldn't want that. And part of my astrology is to get people to think for themselves, to use what they've got, their talents, use their chart if they want to use their chart, and become who they were born to be, who they signed up to be. And that to me is the key always beyond prediction. But as you were saying about your prediction, um, it's often when you're looking at the chart, you're interpreting things and you're only really as good as uh, the interpreter, really, you know, the astrology is only ever as good as whoever's interpreting it. And you can come up with some ideas, but I always say to, to students and to clients, I need context. If you came to me in a very different situation, we'd be looking at those transits in a very different way. If you came to me as the uh, prime minister of the UK or the president of the US, we'd be looking a lot more sensitively perhaps at the day-to-day -day runnings of your business. But um, so context is the key always to understand where that person's coming from, what they're needing from the session, but also how they're using their chart, how they're using their life and their talents. Um, once you've got that, you can often make educated guesses or help them with timing. So to me, astrology isn't about this will happen then. It's more about this is a great time to launch this launch this product in the beginning of October because of this aspect. Um, let, you know, join up with somebody who could help you in October. It's, but the person could sit, sit still, do nothing, be under the duvet and absolutely not participate. So my feeling always is use the chart to help people actively participate in the right rhythm at the right time and you'll get a level of success, whatever that person wants to do. Yeah. If they you know, so astrology is really about the timing and about the insight which we already know it's already it's about just bringing out the insight that the person has about who they are what they need giving them the great timing or the, even the the place with astrocartography you can okay. tell them the part of the the country that or, or the world that's good for them and um, giving them those tools and then what they do with it is very much up to them. Uh, so it's not about prediction. It's about, um, uh, you know, helping them maneuver and be in the rhythm or in the right cycle or the right phase of their life and make the most of it. Yeah, no, this is, this is fantastic. And you know, the people watching this regularly, I've got a client and I'll say to them, have you ever considered astrology? You know, it depends who I'm, working with can i can i ask them that and as you probably appreciate is very often they immediately think it's some kind of fortune telling thing because it's got nothing to do with that yeah. 
you know, it's not some sort of psychic sitting there kind of figuring out what, you've got to have the context. You've got to be prepared to explain what's going on in your life. They can see your chat and then they can start to, they can start to interpret that and feedback and draw the best out of you. And, and so for people watching, if you're thinking, it, it, you know, get it out of your head that it's a fortune telling thing. It's really about seeing through the, through the conversation with the astrologer um, how best to take advantage of possibilities. And I mean, it's been so amazing for you talk, you, you, you speak very quickly there about astrocartography. I did a course with you on that as well. I just love that. I've always loved maps, but the idea that you know, the pair you were born on your track can actually indicate where you'll be good in other parts of the world and where you won't be so good, I found fascinating and I found it to be accurate. Um, and also the thing about Laura and I have moved around a lot. We've literally uh, you know, signed a contract to sell a house at the exact minute that the astrologer said is the best time. We've, we even went to, um, to the Florida Keys, um, to Key West, to get married at exactly the day and exactly the very minute that get the guy told us to get married. And I remember I've got the guy ready to marry us and I'm, I'm, I've got my eye on my watch. I say, okay, come here. I do it now. <laughs> and <laughs> few people think you're crazy, but it's been so accurate for me and so so insightful. I just would but, just love everybody to. to well, I think it, it speaks to some people, and it it doesn't. I know, speak I know. Well. And my feeling always is not to shove it down anybody's throat, well, not try to convince anybody of anything. Yeah. Because people find it if they need to, and when they find it, they find it at the right time for them. I think um, the more you go up in business, the more you realize people secretly use it. And I think there's still a taboo attached to it of it being cranky. But you go to the, to the Far East, you go to India, and they wouldn't live without doing that and being aware of the cycles and the rhythms. Uh, so I remember when you mentioned uh, when we, when I came to one of your mind stores in um, Rada, when you rented out, I think you had the, the Rada studio there oh, yeah. um, a few years ago, and you mentioned astrology, and there were audible giggles, or <laughs> you know, in the in the audience, and uh, and it's interesting, yes, because the you could say, you know, the the largest collection of astrology books is in the Vatican locked away under lock and key, as we, we gather, allegedly. And we know that whatever, most of the holy books are full of astrology. When I get people quote the Bible to me, I remind them who the three wise men were following a particular planetary conjunction. I remind them of the symbolism of Jesus and the 12 disciples, mm -hmm. uh, the 12 different signs all around the son of God, the son of God. So there's a um, tremendous amount of astrological symbolism everywhere. Yeah. And we'll see it everywhere. But there is a skepticism or it's interesting because I teach both astrology and palmistry. Yeah. Uh, palmistry seems to be more of a man subject. And it's very funny because I'll get men ringing up and they'll say, well, do you, are you teaching palmistry this year? And I'll say, yes, we've got a course starting in a few weeks. And I say, but we, it's only a short course. The astrology is a three year course, uh, but you do it term by term and et cetera. And he'll say, well, you know, astrology is a bit like women's magazine rubbish. And I can understand that because it's sort of, what are your stars? And then you look in, Bella or you're looking take a break or whatever and I totally understand that it's been uh, diluted to that uh, currency and sold in that way uh, and palmistry um, the men ring up and they say well it's real because it's in your hand it's not up there uh, and I say to them well you know I'm I'm a man as well and I do both and I've never really seen it like that but it's um, together they're they're pretty impressive together actually, I must say, because the hand is a living reflection of what you're doing and what you've done all your life with your life. And what do your hands look like today? It's different from maybe 10 years ago if you've changed your life. So you want to change, change your life, your hands will change. The chart is a fixed moment in time that gives us opportunities through transits to do, to walk through different doors, to do different things at different times. But the hands are living reflections of who you are. The chart is a, a fixed moment of time that we got born into. Yeah, I mean, that, again, that's, that, you see, once I got out of my head, this has got nothing to do with 
fortune telling, you know, in the sort of weird world that you think that is when you're younger. I went to a palmistry course with you and, and it was absolutely fascinating, you know? Um, and I would, I would encourage people who are maybe something, watching this and they're just, oh, this sounds interesting. Follow your, follow that intuitive feel and, 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 and go and look because it is amazing. And, and what's fascinating is, as you rightly said, your hand changes over time. Well, why wouldn't it? Your sales change over time, you know? And it's just, just amazing stuff. There's so much, so much in it. Um, but tell us a wee bit, Frank, because I, I know it's a big passion of yours, apart from doing the, cons the consult. Although you took a break from it for a while, didn't you? Are, are you still doing consultancy? I'm, I'm back seeing clients. I took a year out after having done them for 25, 26 years wow. regularly. I, about a year and a half ago, I said, you know, I need a break. I'm going to focus on the books, yeah. developing the school online. We have it now online as well. Yeah. Um, the London classes. Um, I have a school in China now. We've got one developing in Japan and Turkey. So, um, yes, I'm being pulled in all sorts of different directions. But that's fun. I love the, I love the challenge. And so I, I stopped for a year seeing clients. I did see a couple of people who were regulars, uh, like the counselling one I mentioned a bit earlier, yeah. um, because that was something that they, they really needed. So I, I didn't tell them I was off on a sabbatical for a year. But everybody else, I just I, uh, removed myself. And it... I needed that to, when I, I, because it's only ever been, I've never, I say I've never had a real job because I've always done astrology and palmistry and created my own work and my life. Never sat down and had an office job, luckily for me anyway. Uh, so it was, I've never been burnt out and I've been extra careful not to do that because I've, there's a lot I want to do before I die. A lot of new subjects to learn. Yeah. Or the, the next thing I want to learn is graphology. Yeah. The handwriting oh. analysis. That's I'd love to do that uh, because to me it's it's um, just another key to understanding who people are. So I took a year out. I'm back doing ses client sessions again, but I think we always need a bit of a break. Otherwise, we do burn out, and we do even with a subject that's uh, so um, varied and eclectic as astrology. I could go down the, the Ray Merriman route and do the, the stocks and the trading. Doesn't interest me, uh, but I wish I'd learned about Bitcoin 10, 12 years ago. That would have been fun, but never mind. Uh, so um, there's always something you can do with your astrology, whether you're counseling, whether you're just adding it to your practice, whether you're simply looking at your transits or reading about your chart. There's always something you can do that I think enhances uh, your your experience of life. And I think so many things happen to us, like the COVID situation, of course, that if we can't find meaning, if we can't find that there's, even if it's not, not something we can control, if we can see that there's meaning there in some way, we find a way of negotiating our way through it. And that's one of the key issues, I think. Astrology gives you a sense of meaning and you think, okay, I understand what that tough period was about and you don't you can either sit with it or you can then evolve from it and so um, you never stop learning in astrology I've been doing it 31 years this year mm -hmm. still feel there's a huge amount to learn people new people to listen to uh, new books to buy <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all those different things yeah. yeah yeah I mean just another question lead me on to where I want to take the conversation um I, 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 I'm not sure but maybe some people think you would need to be some kind of psychic to be an astrologer. I, I don't think that's true. Uh, you might think to some degree, but I, I don't think, I mean, because when I've gone to the, your courses, it's pretty obvious that's not necessary, you know, especially if you're good at, um, if people are talented in certain ways like coaching or, or mentoring and so on, having been able to understand the whole thing about astrology would be an amazing tool. So how did you get into the, deciding to run the school and, and, and you, tell us a bit about the school's journey because and of course if I can make the point people can presumably listening watching can if they want to dip their toe in can go and do an introductory thing and then realize oh actually this is amazing and you know you don't have to be a psychic to begin presumably am I right with that oh well first of all yes I mean if you're if you, I think we've all got 
an intuition yep. with with um, with people with situations. We have a, a sense of of danger, perhaps things we don't listen to at times, of course. But yeah. um, anything that we've got, any life experience, is going to help us with a subject like astrology. So whatever people bring in, we have um, students start sometimes in courses. Some of them have been in business all their life, and they come in, and they all of a sudden they think they have to either be overly psychic or intuitive and in fact what they're bringing is a business sense to the astrology and if they want to continue that way then they'll end up probably being astrologers in the area of business or being able to go into companies like I do sometimes and giving uh, uh, being able to just help the dynamics of a team or helping people with the timing of when to launch different products so whatever life experience somebody has where um, it's to me, it's um, it's going to be valuable to wherever they want to go with their astrology. So whether they're psychic, whether they're business orientated, uh, but I I think generally these days people are moving away from. Uh, well, they're moving towards alternatives in the sense of being able to see around um, obstacles in a different way. I have a, a, a student, a client originally, who's now a student who um, was in um, the oil, oil business yep. and very successful in that and used, um, realized that getting to 50 something, 60 something uh, meant a new journey in life rather than retirement. So what I've noticed in the last 25 years is a shift from uh, in, in business people, two things. One of them is moving away from thinking that everything ends at 60, 65, and you've got to prepare for that. And then you sort of retire and you retire from life as well, which is the, the big casualty that happens, I think. Um, the second is that when... Uh, when crap happens in people's lives, difficulties happen, companies go bust, all sorts of things, people are no longer hitting the bottle. <laughs> They're no longer um, wallowing in self-pity. They're going to astrology or they're going to some other tool to find a way through it to find a way out and all of a sudden they're going to more mystical things to understand the meaning of these cycles rather than think I'm devastated. My company might not exist in five years. I'm going to drink myself silly, for instance. So people are finding that life doesn't end at 60, 65. And they're also finding that with the mystical arts, what I call the perceptive arts, like astrology and palmistry and tarot, the rest of them, that they truly can use those to understand um, more of their life purpose and their life meaning rather than a simple, I've got to reach that figure by the end of the month, sales wise or whatever they, so people are moving in that direction. And that's wonderful to see because people are having different responses now and using astrology to enhance their lives, not for it to become a crutch. I had a client the other day who was in a, a, a no, a woman who rang me wanting a session and she'd become addicted to it, addicted to astrology. And I said to her, you know, you need to leave it alone. Yeah. Because if it's starting to run your life, instead of you finding it insightful and helpful, it's just another addiction in your life. Or yeah. I'm the next astrologer that's going to be your savior or your guru or whatever. Yeah. So um, that's something I really am careful of, particularly with students at the school and also clients, is not developing that dependency on a subject. Um, people say, do you read your hand every day? Do you look at your chart every day? Um, yes and no, maybe. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll have a look at things, uh, but it only reminds me of the overall picture of what I'm what I'm here to do. Um, or I'll wait for a particular aspect in the sky to happen before I send an important email, for instance. I just work with the rhythms of it rather than doing the um, the obsessive thing that some people do or the addictive uh, response to any of these things. I'm so glad you. You said what you're saying there because when I set this up, um, my back, my my motivation was, as I said, as I said to you already before we started, but everyone knows, was to help people with the fear and anxiety back in February, March time, um, because of COVID. But the other thing I shared with them was, I'm now 65, and when I when I was approaching my 60th birthday, I did a course, a mindstore course in Dublin, and the guy comes with his wife they, they always came from um down in southern spain 
to do courses. They, they were originally from Ireland and they would show up often at, Dub, at Dublin courses. And they came along and he was saying to me, he was just talking to me at a break and he was, he was telling me he's now 62. I remember it and he said, you know, Jack, when you get to 60, uh, you're no longer noticed. You become invisible. He said, it'd be a great technique for you to make people be able to be you know, invisible. But the truth of the matter is you get to 60 and you become invisible. And I was like, seriously? He said, absolutely. You'll be shocked when you become invisible. <laughs> and and I then talked to him about, well, wait a minute. You hope you're not believing you're invisible. You, 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 you're, what, what, you know, because Meister was all about, you know, planning, you know, programming your future and stuff. And I realized out of the conversation, I then found myself a couple of years later standing in front of an audience in Glasgow and I said to them, look, I just had an idea. Why don't we create something called Mind Store Centurions with the notion that we'll, we'll live healthily, physically, mentally, spiritually, right up to 100. And then when we do pass, we pass peacefully and it's beautiful. And kind of idea, you know, and just what you just said there, having astrology in this phase of your life when you get to this point when you're thinking okay do you do you retire do you put your feet up and then maybe get in a box before you know it or do you look at what's there and take advantage of it in terms of a, a new phase maybe many phases ahead of you which is fantastic so it's amazing you said that I, i'm aware i want to talk about lots of things but and and i think maybe we we'll maybe do a second week of this. I think I think there's so much here, Frank. I hope you hope you'd be up for that coming back again. Um, in the in the sort of general conversation that people have, um, certainly I, I I find myself using it quite a lot in Facebook posts and stuff. There's two sort of phrases that are very ast astro you know uh, from astrology that come into the zeitgeist often. One of them is the age of Aquarius. You know we, we hear this. You know. I remember as a kid hearing the song, but when, when is that ever coming? <laughs> and it's again, it's back in the zeitgeist in many ways. And the other one, of course, is Mercury's in retrograde. That's now, you even see that in the, I've, I've read it in the Guardian, for example. Um, so tell us a wee bit about those things. You know, what, what, what is the age of Aquarius? And, and, and what about Mercury in retrograde? Tell us a wee bit about that. <laughs> well, there are, <laughs> there are um, different phrases people understand. So they'll, they'll hear about full moons when yeah. they read their um, star signs, their horoscopes for the week, etc. And, you know, mo just to say that when you're reading your, um, your week ahead or your day ahead, if you choose to do that, um, you may want to read your ascendant sign, your rising sign, because it's based more on, on that than your sun sign, generally. But also it's a good thing to remember that um, at some point, I don't know if it's still the same, but at some point when I was doing them 15, 10, 15 years ago, the people doing them were real astrologers rather than uh, people in their tea break, journalists who uh, <laughs> yeah, often the junior person in the office would write them up or they'd be recycled on different things. And so I must say, when you're reading the, the Shelley von Strunkel stuff or the um, Oscar Kane, I think, um, They've all been through schools and taught themselves. That's just something I want to say. But they are speaking in a very general way about it. Yeah. And when I wrote them, being a bossy Aries as I am, the, I found them a great opportunity to tell people what to do on a particular day to make their lives better. Yeah. And in a client session, you're not really telling people what to do. Uh, you're hoping that they you have a discussion and they'll go away feeling empowered to do what they want to do. But when you're writing these things, and believe me, you know, you spend more than a couple of years writing them and you go a little bit insane. And when I, I found myself, actually, they were very good, 90 or 150 words, whatever, whoever I was writing for, great opportunities to give somebody a bit of thought about their week, who, yeah. what they want, and to say, you know, if you want to do this, try after the retrograde mercury or, or do it after the new moon or whatever it may be so it was an opportunity to uh, to give a, advice uh to be a little bit aries and bossy about it without really um doing that as i would do it i wouldn't do that in a session to be honest so mercury retrograde um uh it's um it's a visual thing that we see from the earth astrology is based upon our view of the universe 
So we see the sun rising and we see the sun setting. Of course, we move around the sun. So uh, astrology is what we call earth-centered, geocentric. Yeah. So everything that we see from our position as we're being born is our horoscope. Somebody born at the same moment on the other side of the world, yeah. it could be the sun rising instead of the sun setting. Yeah for instance. So it's our viewpoint of the world. So it is very self-focused, of course. The whole subject is about that. You can do mundane astrology, of course, which is about the movements of the planets, uh, like we have the Jupiter-Saturn coming up in December, or the Saturn-Pluto of the whole of the astrological signature for COVID, for instance. Um, uh, you could look at what's happening in the world around you as well. It doesn't just have to be about, about yeah. you. So Mercury is a um, Mercury retrograde is a three week period, about four times a year, that um, invites you to go back and respond to things of a mercurial nature, for instance. So um, it's a um, Mercury does not go backwards in the sky. It's just a bit like two trains traveling side by side, and we're on one of them, and all of a sudden we see the other train is going slower. Yeah. still forward but slower and yeah. they look like they're going backwards yes. so have you ever been in that situation in a train where you're watching and all of a sudden <laughs> they're going backwards but we're still both going forward no. so it's an optical illusion really right. that's what mercury retrograde is but it mercury is the planet in astrology associated with um it was known as the trickster because when uh, all of astrology is really based on observation yeah. And ancient astrologers would watch Mercury move very fast around from their position, and then it would go into hiding, it would go backwards. And so it had an association over the centuries with um, uh, things that were quick, fast, uh, that could be deceptive, a trickster sort of energy. Yeah. So Mercury has that court jester quality about it, astronomically and astrologically. So when it's in retrograde, anything mercurial, whether it's your mobile phone, whether it's um, email, any form of communication that Mercury is associated with is said to be uh, retrograde, said to be challenging in some way. Yeah. So I always say to people, when Mercury is retrograde, don't buy anything of a Mercury nature, like a car, a cell phone, um, getting new internet, buying something that is about communication or moving forward. Mercury retrograde is a great time to go back and edit stuff, to clean out the garage, clean out the office, get yourself in better shape for when it moves forward. Yeah. So um, the whole world is, uh, is experiencing, all 8 billion of us experiencing Mercury retrograde at the same time. So of course it doesn't affect everybody. In your own chart, it may be in a, point, a part of your chart that it makes it more difficult. I remember under one Mercury retrograde, it hit a planet, um, the planet Neptune, which in astrology is a, can be about chaos and confusion. And in that couple of days, as it went retrograde, uh, I lost my email. Um, somebody was diverting my post. This is back when we used to have proper post. And it was being diverted to another part of the country with along with somebody else's post. And somebody had cut the telephone wire outside the office. So I was literally without email, without post, without the phone. And that doesn't happen to everybody every time, but you do find a lot that under Mercury retrograde, uh, if you're living in London, for instance, you'll get, um, there'll be talks of going on strike on the tube, or there'll be renovations that end up delaying things. So Mercury retrograde is linked often to delays in communication, transport, travel. So all I say is that you can't avoid it unless you wanna stick your head under the duvet for three weeks. Um, but you can double check your flight details. You can double check and get there early. Yeah. You can buy the house later or after, uh, you know, before or after. Uh, all different ways of getting around it, yeah. particularly if you're finding you suffer a bit. Um, but if you're not suffering, you'll hear stories. You'll go online and people are moaning about Mercury retrograde or somehow... Uh, I think it was um, Apple, and they, uh, Apple probably needs a good astrologer because uh, they launched one of the iPhones a few years ago under a Mercury retrograde, and they didn't work. And you know, one thing you don't want to do with a telephone is, or a mobile phone is to to launch launch it under a retrograde Mercury. So that's another one. Um, Age of Aquarius. Can we come okay. before you yeah. before you go yeah. into the Aquarius? Yeah. Let's stay with yeah. Mercury retrograde for a moment because I've always I find it 
consistently fascinating that my flights would be delayed or something would go wrong, someone didn't get my email and all that stuff. It's relatively consistent. Maybe it's because I'm running a program in my brain that attracts it, but nevertheless, I do observe it. And one of the things I've observed often is your friend or you know someone enters into a contract during Mercury retrograde and it kind of goes pear-shaped. It's fascinating how it... And so what I suppose, again, by and large with Mercury retrograde, most people who look at it or get a little bit of knowledge of it wouldn't want to sign a new contract or enter into a new partnership or get married or, I would imagine, in, in, in that period. So what, I, I, because you were talking about it there, uh, one of the things that we have done, this group, is a bunch of us uh, went through an experimental thing about a, about a month, two months ago, where we got um, each of us, there was about 30 of us, 35 of us, and we got a continual glucose monitor because we're interested in this keto thing or low carb thing. And we got involved with an American company. I, got, I managed to get a good deal with them. And we were able to, for, 20, for 14 days with a continual glucose, monitoring what was going on in their bodies with certain foodstuffs and activities and so on. It was fascinating. And what, what I've been doing logically is thinking, okay, let's do it again. Let's go for 28 days rather than 14 because it was so insightful. And I, and I just said, I just realized, I said to them, why don't we start on the 1st of November? Because it'll give us like four weeks to go to our doctors, even get some blood panels so we can monitor things a bit better. And I'm suddenly thinking, oh my God, it's the 1st of November <laughs> in Mercury retrograde. And therefore, should we, what should I buy? Should we maybe think of wait until Mercury's gone away or gone normal, if I want to a silly phrase. Um, rather than do that in the 1st of November. That, I mean, people watching us are thinking, yeah, I'm maybe going to join Jack in the experiment. What do you think? Well, they can't, you can't avoid three weeks of your life, particularly if you're in business like we are, where we're, we're yeah. busy. But to realize that you're in a phase where things are there to be reviewed. Retrograde is really the prefix re. So reviewed, re-edit, uh, reconnect, whatever it may be. Often people come into your life or come back into your life that you haven't seen for many years under a Mercury retrograde uh, with something to tell you. So my feeling is that you can always make the most of any transit. You don't have to hide uh, with that. So I probably wouldn't buy a house or buy a car or uh, a cell phone um, under a retrograde Mercury. Um, if I were to do um, yeah, if I were to do a trip, then in some way, or I were to do a lecture or to release a book, in some way, I would make the packaging, the promo, the focus of the lecture, the focus of the trip about returning to something. Right. One of the great examples that I, I put in a book a long time ago was uh, one of the great successes of the 90s was uh, Friends Reunited. Yes. Uh, you remember the, remember the website long before Facebook and uh, probably, I think, uh, but really the hot website, uh, getting back in touch with people from college, from school, etc. And that was launched under a Mercury retrograde. And that was perfect because it's all about getting back in touch. Mercury yeah. being communication, retrograde, going back, reconnecting. So my feeling with that is um, if you can't avoid it, use it. Um, make it a theme in some way. If I had to do a lecture under a retrograde Mercury for a new group, I'd probably put revisit in the title or reconnect. I'd make it in some way uh, a symbol or to reflect the retrograde. Wow. Wow. I mean, is the 1st of November outside Mercury retrograde or is it still in it? Um, this coming 1st of November. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have to have a look. Hang on a minute. We astrologers walk around with either these giants. I know, I got, yeah, or, Laura's got them everywhere. Or, or the baby one here, which is the very light, light version. Uh, but yeah, we, you learn, I say to the students at the beginning of the course, uh, the LSA, that they, you'll start to look like an astrological geek. As soon as you start the course, you'll be on trains studying these books <laughs> and people will wonder what the hell you're looking at. First of November, Mercury goes, retro, it goes direct on the third. So one of the, one of the things I would say is to go online, those of you interested in it, uh, get a list of when Mercury goes retrograde each year and just be particularly aware of a few days before, a few days after, 
the beginning of it and the same with the end of it. The, yeah. the whole three weeks themselves, you learn to negotiate it. But really the turning points are fascinating. So um, three weeks before that, uh, middle of middle of October, I think it is. Just be aware those few days that things are particularly prone to uh, to delays, to disruption, to miscommunications. Yeah. Well, yeah. Why, why you just say it's actually quite exciting for again people who are thinking of joining in the experiment. If the third of November is when it kicks forward again, that might be a good day to begin, would it not? Especially if we're doing 28 days, which would take us to the end, the end of November. You know, you would get the full 28 days within the month. So I'm thinking, am I right in thinking the third would be a good day to begin? And then between, just make sure, because we've got to send away and get patches, so you maybe have to order them early so you don't lose them in the final week. So I'm feeling better now. Would that be fair? Um, you could do. I would wait a couple of more days after. Oh, would you? Oh, would because you? two or three days around the beginning and the end of it can be disruptive as people oh, right. try to get their feet. So it's either going retrograde or it's retrograde about to go back and be direct. Okay. So I would avoid those two. But really, if you're doing any sort of cycle for 28 days, you really want to listen to the lunar cycle instead. Yeah, of course, yeah. of course. So, um, so when would you suggest? What do you know? Do you know off the top of your head the lunar cycle around November? Let me have a look. Okay, here we go. This is the, what we're used to doing. We're getting like a free part. consultation here, guys. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So the um, the new moon is on the fifteenth of November. Yeah. And the next new moon is on the fourteenth of December. So you've got um, a good twenty eight, twenty nine days between those two new moons. So kick off in the 15th of November, you're saying? 15th of November, there's a new moon in Scorpio. Uh, so wherever the sun is at that time of year, and the sun's pretty consistent, at the beginning of November, it's always in Scorpio. Um, if there's a new moon around that time, it's also going to be in Scorpio, because the new moon means yeah. basically the sun and moon are together in the same sign, yeah. from our point of view, from our perspective. Okay. But what I want to say about the, the new moon and the full moon, this, that cycle, is that one of the, I, I do a lecture now, and I'm doing this in, um, in Germany in a couple of weeks, in Berlin, and it's called Never Launch Anything at the New Moon. Because I, and I argue with astrologers about that sometimes, because I've had clients of mine also go to see other astrologers, and they say, launch it at the new moon. The new moon is a great time for starting something that you're thinking about, um, starting, but it's normally, think about the new moon, there's no light yeah. in the sky. Yeah. So there's no um, moon, there's no sunlight on the moon. So there's no moonlight. Yeah. Um, so we're in the dark. So the new moon is wonderful for brainstorming, finding your way, making a list of the things that you want to do. But not really until a week after when we have a, what we call a first quarter moon, where the moon looks like a half moon in okay. the sky. It's a quarter of the way through a cycle. Do we have enough light to make a good judgment? So when I say to people, when the best time to get married, the best time to launch a business is somewhere between the first week after the new moon, what we call the first quarter and the full moon, those seven days. Yeah. So we think of them, each one of them as a seven day period, a week each, making up a complete 28 day cycle. Yeah. But doing it too early in the new moon, nothing's been tested. There's no light. There's no, in, in astrology, light is like sunlight or moonlight is illumination, yeah. of course. So the idea that symbolically we're in the dark is never a good place to be when you're launching something. But, but funnily enough, if you start taking, you know, if people are getting the, the CGM on their, on, their, on their arm and they're starting to plot with the app and seeing that there is a period of just getting into it. I so agree. I, so, I, I, so it seemed to me, guys, I mean, if, if we did start still on the, you know, four or five days into November, or sorry, precisely at the start of the moon cycle, 15th, it would take about a week to get comfortable with it. And then, so would, would you, so that would still work and we can run all the way through yeah. to the, to, to, to I agree. Moment. So this is, is what I said. Yeah. yeah. Good, this is what right. I say. Um, if you're doing something at a lunar cycle, why not start it at the new moon? It becomes yeah. a wish list. It becomes a thing yeah. that you're dedicated yeah. to. Yeah. In yeah. terms yeah. of a business, 
though if you're launching something like a product you want enough awareness soon usually so you want to launch something as close to the full yeah. moon while the moon is still waxing while it's still growing because you want maximum exposure you want interest but some people like um trump he launched his campaign at a new moon exactly around his birthday some i think it was 2015 whenever it was um, and he launched that then and to me it was a definite sign that he was in the dark but he was ready with the right people to develop it but generally speaking for most people in business i'd say wait until a week between a week and yeah, two yeah. weeks after the yeah, new yeah. Move. but with your with your thing it's probably a good idea to do the yeah, whole because, cycle because frank what, what happens that what for all of us i suppose who are going to do it when you get to the end of the 20 days you've learned so much about your body and about what you've been experimenting then you, you, you leave that, just when that moon's at its brightest, you really understand, you know, what's going on in your body. So that, it's making sense to me. So guys, we're moving it from the 1st to the 15th. <laughs> but but um, by the time that the hour's flying by, I, I have so many questions. Um, let, maybe we can just finish out just now with this one. Uh, tell, us, tell us about the age of Aquarius, Frank. Tell us a wee bit about that. I don't know a huge amount about it. I know people have lots of different opinions of it. Um, in this, I look back a bit cynically and think that the age of Aquarius that was supposed to start in the 60s with the musical hair and the idea of uh, the commune, the people coming together, was pr because it was so, and this is not a judgment, but because no. it was so um, drug ridden and a lot of the people that were in the 60s didn't survive into the 70s. I know. I know friends of mine who lost almost everybody in 1970 from from that. Um, my feeling it was really one of the last um, dredges of the age of Pisces, and Pisces is about drugs and community in a different way. So when I look at that, talking about the age of Aquarius in the 60s, to me it seems more like a a Pisces brotherhood of drugs and everything's cool and great and let's just space out. Uh, Aquarius is uh, an air sign, so it's about the mind, it's about innovation, new perspectives. We um, I, probably the age of Aquarius won't begin for another few hundred years. That's my feeling. It, so we'll, we'll, we'll just be why are we thinking it's round the corner <laughs> because it's a great thing to sell, a bit like the 13th sign that comes up that's crap, but it comes up in the press every three to four years. I should actually start tearing them out and keeping them because um every you know this this 13th sign nonsense comes up every few years when they're having a slow media day that's what i can imagine so um the age of aquarius i think is more a vision a spirit that people want to encourage and i'm all for that uh the idea that it's here i don't see that quite yet <laughs> in terms of um where we are as a uh, as a human race uh really but you know, we've had a very, and we can talk about this in the next session about the the COVID and the, everything else. But we're we're beginning in December, December the twenty first. We're beginning a a new cycle uh, astrologically of Jupiter and Saturn at the very beginning of Aquarius. So my feeling is that after what the year we've had, we're going to begin at the end of the year. We're just emerging into a different type of society with different priorities. This year, I'll talk, we'll talk more about it in the next, in the next lesson, but yeah. So I think the age of Aquarius is a bit of a, um, uh, it's a bit of a myth, really. Yeah, I mean, looking at our schedules, I, well, my schedule and stuff in terms of, I think it might be two weeks before the, the guys see you again. So why don't we do this? Why don't you just say a wee bit about the school? Okay. So what, what's available? Because I suspect people are no, not going to wait two weeks. They want to find out about Frank and where, where do I get in touch with them? Maybe you could just, you know, Tell us, how do they get in touch with you? What, what website should they check out and so on? Great. Well, thank you. Thanks for that, Jack. Um, got two websites for the school, londonschoolofastrology.co.uk, which is the London classes. That yep. will take you to the other website, which is londonschoolofastrology.com. Yep. And both sites uh, offer, offer astrology courses. The co.uk is for doing London classes, the dot com is for doing anything online. Mm. And we teach astrology, we teach tarot, we teach palmistry. Yep. And the dot the London School of 
www.londonschoolofastrology.com uh, is everything online that you can start at any given, any time you like. Uh, but we have a lot of live Q&As during the year as well. So people can get in touch by going on their website, those websites and emailing me, uh, or they can, I th um, I think there's a yeah they can email me that's the easiest probably way uh, of doing that yeah and i suppose if someone doesn't remember the london school of .co or whatever it is could they find you just as frank clifford astrologer would that find their find their way they will there? they'll find me in all sorts of places there um yeah. i have a website there that um has my consultation links and stuff so i have a frank clifford.co.uk so there's lots of ways to find me the next time we will talk about covid but so you're still actually able to do live London courses with COVID. Are you still doing that? Right now, yes. We started the power courses last Saturday. Fantastic. And, uh, yeah, there are lots of things. They have to take our address. Uh, they, people have to be masked up. Um, we're all separated in different parts of the room, that sort of thing. And so it, it's a different experience. Uh, we're doing the astrology. We've got an open evening next yeah. Thursday the 8th of October and then three weeks later we start our courses they'll yeah. be in person unless the government decides to shut down yeah. friends meeting house in Houston where we see people yeah. so uh, it all depends on what's going on if, if they do shut us down and we can't get to the venue we'll just do what we did yeah. in June and, and do everything online again yeah. so it'll be a live experience in person or online uh, we've, we have to be you know everybody has to be flexible these days with everything and the other thing I'd like to talk to you about next time, and I know people love it, I mean, one of the things about MindStore is the ability to use some of our tools and techniques to intuitively make a decision, right? From moment to moment, big stuff, small stuff. Should I buy this book? You know, you do a thing, oh yeah, I'll buy the book or not. Right through to more challenging or more important decisions. And one of the things that I've learned to love and, and really cherish is tarot as a tool for making decisions and Laura's doing a course with you guys just now and it's and I, I keep hearing parts of it it's fantastic um so it'll be good to talk about that as well because that'll fit in with the, the whole mind store thing people making decisions uh, again tarot's got a kind of weird sort of uh press if you know what i mean by people who are frightened of it or whatever mad reason um it's just a wonderful beautiful tool and and, and uh, so we'll talk about that as well frank listen i i can't thank you enough for Given us this time. That'd be great. It's great to chat with you and see you again. And uh, even if it's virtually, uh, <laughs> and it's great to connect. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So, we'll catch up again. And we'll, everybody knows this. We're going to do this in a moment, but we will. We will we'll, okay, we'll, I don't have to change my shirt. Is that okay? Oh, that's good. Okay, that's good. <laughs> we will put this, the, the second one out in two weeks, two weeks after this one goes live. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. Bye now. Bye-bye.